I mean, if you would open your Bibles up to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts 1 is where we'll be back here in just a minute as we uh, continue our studies in the book of Acts to think about the kingdom of God and uh, the kingdom that Jesus began with all that he did and all that he taught and the kingdom that he continued through his disciples and that he continues even to this day through those who are faithful to him. And that's what we want to be a part of. I'm really glad that we're able to share in worship today and for us to be able to come back together and um, encourage each other and help each other. I hope the next few minutes will help you. Whenever everybody started hearing the good news of the king, a lot of things were changing. It wasn't just Essenes and Sadducees and Pharisees all trying to figure out how to deal with Romans uh, invading their lives. There was this new group that had emerged, the sect of the Nazarenes. And they were pretty robust. A lot of people were believing in this Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, challenging the establishment, at least the other groups, the Sadducees and Pharisees and somewhat the Essenes were all kind of cooperative. But this group, I mean, they came to the temple whenever they would do their hours of prayer and things like that. But they were something different than the rest of us. And I don't know, maybe maybe one day whenever they all got together, the people that mattered at least got together to decide what was going to happen Uh, because there had been another outbreak of this preaching and all this kind of thing, Uh, the council got together to decide what to do about this. And I have no idea, but I wonder, maybe there was a a man in the group, maybe, maybe he was a little younger, maybe his name was Ezra or Eli or some such name, and he heard all the buzz, everybody talking as they're going. You heard about these folks? I hear they say there was somebody from Galilee, Nazareth, who's actually the Messiah. I can't believe that. And they're upsetting the establishment and they're all, I don't, I don't know what's going on. I think we need to just stamp them out right now and get rid of them. And other people thought, I don't know. I've heard some of the priests are even believing in this stuff. I don't know, maybe, maybe we need to go with this. And then they got there to the council meeting and uh, a lot of people were ready to throw these guys in prison or worse for what they were doing. And there was an old head who stood up in the midst of them, somebody that everybody knew and respected, Gamaliel. And he said, listen, y'all, you know what happened with Thutis and Judas and all those kinds of fellas who led little revolutions like this, claiming to be the Messiah and leading groups? It all fizzled out. Maybe this one will be like that. And they'll just fade out. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people are getting all worked up about this Jesus of Nazareth, but... Who knows if it'll last. And then again, if it does last, we might need to go ahead and grapple with the fact that this is it. That it really is from God. And if this really is from God, do we want to be on the opposite side of that? The council meeting broke up and everybody went their separate ways. And I wonder with our little imaginary friend, Ezra, or whatever his name might have been, I wonder if he might have walked away and thought to himself, I wonder if this is the kingdom. I wonder if these people really are the true people of God. The ones that are restoring the kingdom as God would have had it from creation and with Israel and ever since that he's been promised for the whole world. Is this really the kingdom? And I wonder how our imaginary friend might have figured that out. I know how the apostles told people to figure it out. I know how Jesus told people to figure it out. was to go back to their scriptures, especially to the prophets. And if this man would have gone back to inquire seriously, are these people the true citizens of heaven? Is this the kingdom of God happening right here in our midst? Is this really it? And if he went back to his scriptures and went back to the prophets, he would have found something like, okay, this is how I'm going to know whether or not it's really the kingdom of God. And I want to just take a quick time out. This isn't just a fun little uh, fake history, imaginary history we're doing here. This is an important question for us. Do you know any religious people? Religious people who um, 
you wouldn't agree with. People you'd even say, hey, friend, you need to repent and you need to come into the true kingdom of God. You need to come under his rule for real. And they might argue with you back that maybe you need to come into the, what they believe to be the kingdom. How are we going to figure this out? What is the true kingdom of God? And that's not just something that we should think about in relation to how we speak and interact with our neighbors. It's actually something, I don't know, maybe you never have this problem, but do you ever look inside yourself or look around at your flawed, imperfect brethren and think, is this it? Are we really doing this thing correctly? Is this the kingdom? Or are we just playing church? Are we just religious people making ourselves feel better, singing some songs and praying some prayers? Is this the kingdom? What about it? Who are the legitimate, true, real people of God? And I'll tell you, uh, Luke may have been most preoccupied with this question as he's writing this book about the kingdom. We kind of talked about this this morning, but there's a lot of ways you can read the book of Acts as far as what this book is telling us about, what it's about. It's a book about, uh, it tells us about how to become a Christian, how to be saved. It tells us a book, it's a book that tells us about how to tell people how to be saved. Um, there's a lot of theology, especially in the sermons in the book of Acts and the teachings that explain to us um, how to think about God and how to think about Christ and that sort of thing. There's certainly many, many important lessons about how to function as God's people together. What are we, what's our life together supposed to look like? What's my life as a All that kind of stuff. And certainly uh, the Spirit guided Luke to include all of those things in his history here. But do you ever read some of the stories in the book of Acts and you think, I appreciate it, and I'm not being disrespectful. Whatever God thinks we need to know, that's what we need to know. But why did we need to know that? Why did we need one-fourth of the book, starting from about chapter, middle of chapter 21 all the way to the end, about a guy going to a bunch of different prisons? You ever thought about that? Do you think Paul was the only Christian who went to prison and who had some interesting stories in that? And yet, for whatever reason... God's Spirit said, we need to make sure to tell these stories about this man going to jail a lot. And there's other stories like that that you think, well, that's an interesting little detail about, uh, I don't know, like maybe in um, Acts 18, whenever the saints uh, uh, faced persecution from the Jews, and then the, the authorities there in Corinth said, what are you guys doing? Who cares? Leave them alone. And actually, then they ended up beating the uh, leader of the synagogue I don't know. Why did we need that story? What's the point of all this? You know, in the book of Luke, Luke says to Theophilus, I've written these things to you about Jesus so that you may have certainty about what you believed. That's why I've put together this, this gospel. In other words, the gospel of Luke was written to confirm the legitimacy of Jesus of Nazareth as the Christ, the Messiah. And some argue, and I think it's a pretty persuasive uh, idea, that the book of Acts, the primary motivation was to write these stories to confirm the legitimacy of the true people of God. That these Nazarenes, as they were called, these Christians, as they were called, probably in a pejorative way, they're the real deal. This is the real thing. And I'm going to tell you the story of how this thing happened. Our legitimacy as God's people or the legitimacy of what the, and maybe I say this way, what legitimates anybody as God's people is a really important question. It's an important question as we go out there preaching the gospel to our friends and neighbors. And it's an important question for us to consider as we examine ourselves to say, hey, is this the kingdom? Is this what we're a part of? Are we really going in the way that King Jesus wants us to go? Now back to our, our, our buddy who would be wondering about this question. Are these people the real ones or are they imposters? Are they fake? Are they pretenders? If he went back into his scriptures, he would have found something kind of interesting. We're going to come right back to Acts 1, but you want to go with me to some of the passages maybe he might have found? Go to Isaiah 32. Isaiah chapter 32. Isaiah 32 is a, a pointedly messianic passage. In the midst of talking about God's judgment upon all the nations. <coughs> in verse 1, <clears throat> it says, Behold, a king will reign righteously, and princes will rule justly. Each will be like a refuge from the wind and a shelter from the storm, like streams of water in a dry country, like the shade of a huge rock in an exhausted land. 
Then the eyes of those who see will not be blinded, and the ears of those who hear will listen. And the passage goes on to talk about all these things that will happen. A king will reign righteously. Well, we know who that's about. We've heard the good news. The king has come. Our king, who has demonstrated the righteousness of God himself, this is our king. And this is a description, no doubt, of the followers of the king who will rule justly along with him. Daniel 7, right? All this kind of stuff. Okay, cool. Messianic passage. All right, who are the real people of the Messiah? What would mark them out? What would define them? What would differentiate them from everyone else? Go a little further down in the passage. And there's a number of things we could say about this. But one of the really important things... Look at verse, uh, beginning in verse 14. He talks about how the, the place where God's people are has been devastated. And it says, For the palace has been neglected, the populated city abandoned. Hill and watchtower have become caves forever. A delight for wild donkeys, a pasture for flocks. That doesn't sound too good. But what, when the king comes, what's it going to be like? When that king who reigns in righteousness, what's it going to be like? Verse 15, Until the Spirit is poured out from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fertile field, and the fertile field is considered as a forest. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness will remain in the fertile field. Those people who rule in righteousness and justice will be people upon whom the Spirit of God has been poured. And the work of righteousness, verse 17, will be peace, and the service of righteousness, quietness and confidence forever. Go over a few more pages. Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44. <laughs> The people of God, of course, were disturbed for all the destruction that their sin would bring upon them. But God tells them not to fear, that it wouldn't stay this way forever. Verse 3, why? Because, or 4, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. How are you going to give this life? How are you going to enliven us who've been broken down by our sin? I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants, and they will spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of water. You know, I'm pretty sure the Jewish council felt like these Nazarenes were springing up like grass in the water, just popping up out of nowhere. Where did all these people come from saying Jesus is the Christ? This is what was happening. And this one will say, I am the Lord's, and that one will call him the name of Jacob, and another will write on his hand, belonging to the Lord, and will give himself Israel's name with honor. What's going to be so special about these people? The Spirit will be poured upon them. That will mark them out as belonging to the Lord, being His truly. One more passage, Ezekiel chapter 39. Ezekiel 39. Ezekiel prophesies of the time when the, the dead people of God will be raised up. Those who've been broken and divided and were lost like sheep without a shepherd would be bound back up together and their shepherd would rule over them and they'd be brought back like dry bones back to a real life as an army for God to work in the world. How would this happen? What would mark these people out and define them? Verse, uh, let's start in verse 25. This is what the Lord God says, Ezekiel 39, 25. Now I will restore the fortunes of Jacob and have mercy on all the house of Israel and I will be jealous for my holy name. They will forget their disgrace and all their treachery which they perpetrated against me when they live securely on their own land with no one to make them afraid. Sounds like they're going to have forgiveness of sins. Sounds like they're going to have God's presence with them. It's going to be pretty special. When I bring them back from the peoples and gather them from the lands of their enemies, then I shall show myself holy through them in the sight of the many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God because I made them go into exile among the nations. And then I gathered them again to their own land and I will leave none of them there any longer. Here's the true people of God back together with God in their midst. What's so special about them? Verse 29, I will no longer hide my face from them any longer for I will have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, declares the Lord. These are just a few of what I believe to be a large number of scriptures in the Old Testament that look forward to the time of, hey, here's what's gonna make the people of God different. Here's what's going to differentiate the people of God from everybody else. Here's how you'll know where the true kingdom of God is. It's the place where the Spirit of God, it's the people among whom the Spirit of God dwells. Go back to Acts chapter 1. Here's our, as we're on our little uh, quest, coming out of our council meeting, trying to figure out, are these Nazarenes the real people of God? The answer is yes. And in this book where, where Luke uh, seeks to give meticulous detail to prove to us that yes, these are the real people. They are the legitimate people of God. The power 
that gave them that legitimacy, the thing that set them apart as God's people, was the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. This was the power of the early church. It wasn't that they had a great strategy or they were very wise or that they were very wealthy. Matter of fact, they were the people that everybody else looked down upon and didn't think were worth much of anything. But the thing that was undeniable about them was the powerful presence of the Spirit of God among them. That's what set them apart. That's what proved that, yes, this is where God's kingdom is residing. These are the people who make up God's kingdom. And listen, in the very beginning of the book of Acts, this is emphasized quite a lot. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had given orders by the Holy Spirit. That's even a strange way to talk, to be honest. And I, again, I don't mean any disrespect. It's there because it's the way it needs to be. But I would just expect as he gave orders, boom, the end. It's Jesus himself talking. But in some way, shape, or form, and I don't totally even know what it meant, but his orders or his instructions were given by the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of things regarding the kingdom of God. And then he gathers them together and he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father promised. What had the Father promised? Which, he said... You heard from me, for John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. What's going to allow these men to go on and continue the kingdom that Jesus began when he came? That this, they would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, so when they come together, they began asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? But he said to them, it is not for you to know periods of time or appointed times which the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria as far as the remotest part of the earth. Right off the bat, Jesus says, what is the authenticating mark of his people? And here as he speaks to his apostles, he emphasizes the role of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, the presence of the Spirit in their lives and that being the marker for what sets them apart and defines them as the legitimate, true, authentic, real, indeed, people of God. Whenever we ask this question, is this the kingdom? The question should be, well, is the spirit there? Is the spirit among these people? Because that's really the authenticating power of the kingdom among uh, God's true people. We see it here in Christ's final promise and commission. You see it uh, in some of the things we spoke about this morning at the launch of the kingdom, if we can say it that way, at Pentecost. How did that get going? The Spirit was poured out upon them. They're speaking in tongues and they're doing all these things. The first passage that's quoted in the preaching of the gospel is a passage about the Spirit being poured out upon them from on high, from the prophets, much like the ones that we read just a moment ago. That's why you should believe that we really are the right people, is what Peter says. Look, the Spirit of God is working among us. That's how you know. How about this statement all throughout the book of Acts? Whenever you see disciples doing things, there will be this statement that so-and-so was filled with the Spirit. And sometimes that filled with the Spirit is a reference to uh, them having a moment where they're able in a special way to enact some sort of supernatural, miraculous uh, gift or activity. Sometimes it sure seems to just be a description of their godly character. I look at a couple of examples of this in the book of Acts. How about Acts chapter 4? Acts chapter 4. This is one of the times when <clears throat> the apostles have been uh, preaching. Peter and John uh, perform a miracle by the power of the Spirit to, to raise a lame man to be able to walk. They then take opportunity to preach to the crowd that gathers. And because of that preaching, many people believe. And because of that, the authorities, the council members of the Jews, did not appreciate that one little bit. And so they arrest Peter and John and they get on to him and all this kind of stuff. And uh, in verse 8... Well, verse 7, when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? And then it says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, and then he preaches to them. What does it mean that he was filled with the Spirit in this context? Like I said, you see in uh, uh, Acts 2 and Acts 13, that filled with the Spirit is a way of describing they did something in a, a supernatural, miraculous sort of way. And that certainly could be here. For instance, Jesus promised his apostles Whenever you stand before authorities, don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit will give you words to speak in that moment. And I have no doubt that that is, uh, at least in part, what being filled with the Spirit meant for Peter right here. But look at verse 13. And what did being filled with the Spirit uh, look like 
in these men. Verse 13, after they preach, and the, the council members here, verse 13 it says, now they, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John, or the boldness, yours might say, and they understood they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. All right, so to be filled with the Spirit in this context certainly meant nothing less than in this situation, the apostles having the, the words to speak from the Lord Himself. But it apparently meant something more than that too, something uh, related but more. It meant boldness in the face of opposition and persecution. They didn't care because they were filled with the Spirit. They didn't care what you did to us. They don't care what you say to me. We're people who are filled with the Spirit. It also meant that in their conduct and their behavior, and I don't know, was it their posture and their body language? Was it the way their eyes looked as they spoke? Was it something about, I don't know what it was, but something about these men, the council members said, didn't we just do this? Didn't we just get rid of their master? These guys look just like him in their conduct. Being filled with the Spirit meant that they were like Jesus himself. After they end up getting released in this case, they go to their companions, they pray, and look what happens in verse 31. It says, And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't say that being filled with the Spirit meant they were going out and performing miracles or speaking in tongues or anything like that. It says they began to speak the word of God with boldness. They cared about their neighbors enough to make sure that they knew about the gospel. They spoke in a bold manner about the gospel itself. That's what being filled with the Spirit meant. If you go over to Acts chapter 6, you see a similar kind of situation where uh, we won't get into all the details of the occasion. I think, Lord willing, we'll talk about this tomorrow night. But in verse 3, it says, Instead, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation. In other words, their character needed to be of a high caliber. Well, what would define somebody of high caliber as a Christian in their character? They are full of the spirit and of wisdom whom we may put in charge of this task. By the way, the task was making sure widows are cared for. So filled with the spirit in this context would mean these are men who have an otherworldly kind of character. They care for those that others would neglect. They're wise. They're people who have such a character that's been cultivated to where it's of good reputation among other people. It seems to me that later on they, uh, well, yeah, anyway, we'll stop right there. You get the point. This is the same thing is said of Stephen in Acts chapter 6 and verse 10. What made Christians so special? They were filled with the Spirit. I like, by the way, you may know this, the word for Spirit, both in Old and New Testament, is the same word for breath. Breath. So um, whenever we read that people are filled with the Spirit, maybe the way we should think about it is they were people who were breathing God's oxygen. You know what I mean? They weren't breathing the toxic waste of this world. Those who are really of the kingdom are people who are breathing the air of God and are flourishing in that. You know the difference between people who uh, live in places like where I live now and live in places like where you live. It's a big difference because of the air you're breathing. You know what I mean? Same with these people. They were filled with the Spirit. And that's what legitimated them, set them apart, authenticated them, as the people of God. And I love this statement in Acts chapter 9 and verse 31. Acts chapter 9 and verse 31. It says about the saints and the church, which is undergoing a lot of difficulties and persecution and problems. But verse 31 says, even in that moment, so the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, the places that Jesus said they would go by the power of the Spirit, enjoyed peace as it was being built up and as it continued in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they multiplied or it kept increasing, yours might say. What caused their flourishing? They were getting squashed at every opportunity. I mean, all political forces, economic forces, history was against them, everything was against them. They were kind of even against themselves half the time early on in the book of Acts. And yet somehow they kept increasing. They were flourishing. They were doing well. I mean, look at Acts chapter 13 and verse 52, as there are people who um, kind of make a big deal out of rejecting the gospel in their city. Those who heard the gospel, those who received it, verse 52, the disciples, Acts 13, verse 52, the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. This is what made them well. If you asked an early saint, hey, what makes your life so good? They tell you lots of things. Jesus is king. He's risen from the dead. We know God is on our side. The, the, the ends of the ages are upon us and we're ushering in this new era. This is great. 
And you know what, man? We've got the Spirit of God among us. That's why we're flourishing. We know, like in Romans chapter 8, that no matter what happens, they can kill us when they persecute us, but we'll be raised up by the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will be raised from the dead. So honestly, we're good, man. And we're trying to bring everybody else in that we can to enjoy this new life by the power of the Spirit of God. That's what makes our lives matter. That's what makes this thing work is because of the power of the Spirit of God. That's the true power of the early church was the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. All right, I'm back to our buddy Ezra. Let's pretend he's been reading his scriptures and now he's doing a little up close and personal investigation himself. He's met some of these disciples. Maybe he goes at night like Nicodemus did to kind of make sure he doesn't get in too much trouble. And he's with them in their meetings and their gatherings and their worship and their times of talking and breaking bread house to house. And he finally pulls one of his friends aside and says, hey, I've been listening to you guys and you know I've asked you several times and you've been telling me that the thing that makes your life special, the thing that really marks you guys out, as the prophet said, is the new life you share in the Spirit of God. How do I get in on that? And how do we continue in that if I want to enjoy that myself? Who knows? Maybe Luke was in town and this brother said, hey, actually, you know what? Our brother Luke has been taking a lot of notes on this. He's putting together a little historical volume to help people understand how this works. Luke, come on over here. And Luke comes on over and he's got his binders full of information and he sets them down and says, all right, what do you need to know? And the guy says, look, I get it. Just like the prophet said, just like Jesus himself was filled with the spirit of his ministry, I get that the real thing that makes you guys special is the work of God's spirit in your lives. You're filled with his spirit. You're being guided by his spirit. All the ways that y'all talk about this, that's great. But how does that work? Because it all kind of sounds a little hocus pocusy, kind of spooky to me. I don't really get how it works at all. Can you break it down for me? Explain it to me. All right, quick time out. Let's be with us, not back with them. Do you ever kind of sense that? I wonder if we did a show of hands and said, how many people are uncomfortable with all this spirit talk in this sermon being the thing? I wonder if some of us would raise our hands. And I don't mean like, oh, brother, you can't be reading Bible verse about the spirit, but just like, I don't know what to say about that. I don't know how that works. I don't know what it means. I know some stuff that people say that doesn't line up with the scriptures. And so I know it can't be that. But I also know I shouldn't walk around here and never acknowledge the importance and the power of God's spirit among us. So what are we supposed to do about this? How does this thing work? Well, fortunately, Luke lets us know. Do you notice back in Acts chapter 1, what was the, the vehicle for the influence of God's Spirit? How does God break into the world by His Spirit? Well, first of all, like God always has, He's using human vessels to do that, like He did from the very beginning in creation, as He did in His Son Jesus. He uses these human vessels to bring His Spirit's power to bear upon the world, to bring people into the kingdom so that they too can share in the blessing of God's people of having his spirit. Verse uh, 2. It says that, end of the verse, he gave orders by the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Verse 4, gathering them together, he commanded them to not leave Jerusalem. And he reminds them of the promise that was made of the Spirit to be poured out upon them. And then they ask him about, is, this, is it time for this, the kingdom to be restored and all that sort of thing? And he promises them once again in verse 8, you will receive power when the Spirit is poured out upon you. God, the powerful presence of God's Spirit is administered through the ministry of the apostles of Jesus Christ. The way that we access the power of God's Spirit, the the presence of God's Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit is through the apostles of Jesus Christ. In other words, uh, normally, and there's, I think, maybe one exception we could say in the book of Acts, but even then there's apostolic influence in this. But almost always in the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament, it's clear that the Spirit's, uh, the breath of God filling up the spiritual lungs of the followers of Jesus happens and comes through 
the work of the apostles of Jesus Christ. Uh, so check this out and, and, and just look at some of the things here in the book of Acts that, that highlight this for us. Uh, number one, how about the fact that uh, whenever um, signs and wonders were being performed, initially it was only always the apostles. For the first several chapters of the book of Acts, there's special note uh, 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 attention given to note that it's the apostles performing signs and wonders by the Spirit. Acts chapter 2 and verse 43 Acts 2 and verse 43. This is after people have come into the kingdom, come under Jesus' rule to, to receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Remember that was part of the promise of, hey, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 43, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place. And he could have ended it right there if he wanted to. And he could have said through the followers of Jesus because that's true, but he doesn't say that. He makes special, gives special attention to say, hey, it was through the apostles. I'll go over a couple chapters into Acts chapter 5. Acts 5 and verse 32. By the way, there's a couple of examples of the apostles uh, doing these kinds of things where they're, where they're uh, uh, working. And sorry, it says 32 should be Acts 5 verse 12. It says at the hands of the apostles, Acts 5 and verse 12, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people at the hands of the apostles. How did you see the work of the Spirit? How would you come into contact with the life-giving work of the Spirit that raised people from the dead and made the lame walk and said, hey, look, here's the people of God. It was through the ministry of the apostles. Um, now, they didn't stop right there. Eventually, other saints also could perform miraculous signs and wonders by the Spirit. But in Acts chapter 8, we see that the way that happened was through the apostles themselves. Some people had become Christians in Samaria. And then verse 14, Peter and John come down. Verse 15 says, they came down and prayed for them that they would receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon, who was a convert there, uh, saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Because he wanted to receive the Spirit himself? No, listen to what he wanted, verse 19. Saying, give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, Simon recognized, and here we have his words recorded, that hey, not every saint gets to give people supernatural abilities by the Spirit. Sure, when you're baptized into Christ, you receive the gift of the Spirit, but this ability to be able to give people supernatural powers, that's apparently only these guys, only the apostles that are allowed to do it. And Peter gets on him in a big way and says, you have no part or portion in this matter. You're not a part of this, buddy. You're not in this, and you need to repent thinking that money is a way to, to handle this business, right? The apostles were the central figures in the bestowment of miraculous, supernatural giftings. If you go a little further on in the book of Acts, I'm not going to read all of these texts, but you can go all throughout it. And when you see the preaching of the gospel or the establishment of what is the correct answer, well, that's not coming from people. That's coming from God by His Spirit. And who is it that we go to to confirm what is from God's Spirit and what isn't? Well, in Acts chapter 15, for instance, they went to the apostles. And whenever they all sat around to kind of settle this matter of how do people get saved and that sort of thing, they said, how about it, apostles? And they're the ones who said, and I love there's a line in Acts 15 and verse 28, as the apostles with their associates write this letter to confirm the truth, they say, it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. Well, couldn't every Christian just say, I'm pretty sure this is what I think the Holy Spirit says about this. Apparently not. Apparently you had to go through the authorized representatives of King Jesus, who by his spirit said, no, this is what's right. This is the answer. This is what's going on through the apostles. And I'll tell you, with all this uh, emphasis <clears throat> on the apostles being this access point for the powerful presence of the Spirit of God, Probably my favorite example of this is a reverse example. Uh, you may know it. You may remember in Acts chapter 19, there were some men in the city of Ephesus who had heard about all these exorcisms being performed by these uh, Jesus followers led by this man named Paul. And they thought, cool, that sounds good. We're into that too. And so they go and there's somebody that's got some demons and they say, I adjure you, but in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, get out. And they're probably feeling pretty good. They're like, all right, we found the new incantation, the right, you know, code name to get these demons out. We're good to go. And the demon said, Jesus, I know. And 
Paul I know. But I don't know you. And you remember what happens next. Those dudes got stripped naked, beat, and went running down the street for their lives. Now, what's the point of that? That's another one of those little stories in the book of Acts. You're like, I don't know. Did we need that story? I mean, it's kind of funny, I guess. But other than that, I'm not real sure. Why did we need that one? You know why we needed that one? Proof that not everybody can run around here saying that they can do X, Y, Z by the Spirit of God, that they have authority to, to, to uh, perform whatever kinds of powers or to establish this is the way God's, spirits work, uh, God's Spirit works or that's the way it works. No, no. There's an overthrow of unauthorized operators. People who say, hey, we can do the same stuff that the apostles can do. The Spirit being say, no way, dude. That's not how this thing's going to work. The power for the kingdom of God, the thing that authenticates and legitimates God's people is the presence of his spirit. And the way that the power of God's spirit and the presence of God's spirit is accessed is through the apostles of Jesus Christ. Can I show you a text in the book of Ephesians that really ties this together for us in a great way? Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2 and we'll start in verse 17. Ephesians 2, 17 is very reminiscent of some of those passages we read in the prophets where it speaks about how all of God's people are spread out, but he'll gather them together and bring them together under their king, Jesus. Verse 17 says, And he, that is Jesus, came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. You notice in this text, he talks about people who have come to Jesus and he says, we have access to God. How is it? In one spirit, verse uh, 18. Uh, We're being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit, verse 22. What is it that makes us special? What is it that makes our lives worth anything? It's the presence of God's spirit among us. That's what it is. Whether you can perform supernatural miraculous deeds or not, that's the thing that sets a real follower of Jesus apart from all the imposters. That's what sets apart and defines the true kingdom of God is the powerful presence of the Spirit of God. How is that accessed? Well, the Spirit is present with those who build their lives upon the apostles and prophets. By the way, chapter 3, Paul goes on to talk a little bit about his ministry in that and how this is how it works, that if you want to access the powerful presence of God's Spirit, you build your life on the, the doctrine, the lives, the guidance of the apostles of Jesus Christ. I think I'm going to say this now. <clears throat> Maybe it would be better later, but I'm going to say it now. I wonder, I think, I think, and you test this out and see what you think. I think a lot of people uh, buy into one of these ideas or the other. Religious people, I mean. If you said, hey, what defines somebody who's a real member of the kingdom of God? They'd say, Spirit of God. They're guided by the Spirit. They're led by the Spirit. They're filled by the Spirit. And you might say, okay, yeah, yeah. What, what do you think the apostles role in that? Oh, they're just men like the rest of us, you know? Like we're all, and then whatever doctrines you can kind of go on, any, any number of uh, little streams that break off from that, that flow of thought, that this is what it's all about, the presence of the Spirit of God. And then maybe someone else, if you said, hey, what does it mean to really be a real follower of Jesus? Hey, you better be really serious about following after the teachings of the apostles, the example of the apostles, follow in their footsteps and make sure that you do what they say. That's what really sets apart the true people of God. Amen, brother. What do you think is the, the deal with the Spirit in all of that stuff? Well, look, uh, I don't really like talking about that because I don't even understand it totally, so I don't really think it's worth talking about. Let's just concentrate on... Do you get what I'm saying? Have you heard that kind of stuff? Have you talked that kind of way to yourself to try to reconcile how to deal with all of this I think there's a wrestling match we have to do and it's actually the wrestling match of faith Um, faith means reliance I don't know the answers I don't know how God works I don't know how he does the stuff that he does but I rely upon him 
to give me life, to give me hope, to forgive me, to save me, to do all this stuff. It's why we're baptized, because we rely on God to take our old life, bury it, and give us a new one. And I don't know, how does the blood of Jesus come into contact with us through the watery grave of baptism? You heard somebody say something like that? And then somebody's like, can you explain that to me? And then we just say, well, because you, you're baptized. And like, yeah, I got that part. But how does that stuff work? You're like, well, you come in contact with the blood of Jesus. And like, yeah, but how? And you're like, well, through the watery graves of baptism. He's like, yeah, but how? I don't understand. We rely upon God to do things that he says he'll do. Faith means reliance. Like the person who says, hey, what really gives us something in our life is the presence of the Spirit of God. Faith also means responsibility. That I'm going to do the things that God says because I believe in him and I trust him and I'll follow him wherever he leads. And that means that there are things that are under, very understandable and I better make sure and do them. And if I don't do them, then I can't really claim to be a person of faith. You know what I'm saying? Reliance and responsibility. And I think for a lot of religious folks, and I'll put myself in the front of the line, I'm sure probably even more than I want to admit or, or, or could recognize that we kind of vacillate between these two things of relying on the Lord and taking our responsibility to the Lord seriously. And really what it means to follow Jesus is for those two things to come together each and every day. And that's why I need to get comfortable with this kind of answer. Uh, what makes us the true people of God? It's that we're filled with the Spirit. We're led by the Spirit. We're guided by the Spirit. We're all the things that the rest of the New Testament talks about in describing our nature as God's people. And what, it, what that means is, is that I'm going to live a life in harmony with the direction of the authority that was given by Jesus to his apostles. And let's put these together maybe in this statement. The Spirit's powerful presence is with all those who submit to the rule of Christ through his apostles. That's what makes the true kingdom of God. Where is the kingdom? Is this the true kingdom? Well, are the people there filled with the Spirit? Are the people there submitting to the rule of Christ through his apostles? If the answer is no, then no, that's not the true kingdom of God. If we're not being transformed more and more to be like Jesus, then I'll tell you something's off about what, whatever we're submitting to. We may be submitting to some parts of what the apostles' doctrine is, but if we're not becoming more like Christ, breathing his breath, being filled with his spirit more every day, people who are bold and kind and righteous and honest and pure from sin and who love our neighbors as ourselves and don't care about what the cost may be of following Jesus and have foregone materialism and greed and all the things that, that permeate the toxic waste of our world. If we're not being changed in that way, then we need to go back and follow after those that Jesus said, listen to them. So here's a couple of thoughts to wrap this up for us. And some arenas in life where we need to be testing ourselves. I need to be testing myself. And I don't mean in some sort of, I don't want to encourage this because I don't think it's a very good way, a righteous way for us to live as Christians where we're just constantly like, uh, I don't know if I'm a real Christian. I don't know if I'm, I mean, there's literally whole books of the Bible. Go read First John. It says, hey, you are. And here's the, just check out these, these parameters and go live this way. But we do need to be serious with ourselves and we need to be serious in our dialogue with our neighbors to challenge them and to be challenged ourselves with the same standard because what we want is everybody to come under the same banner, the banner of Jesus our King. And the way that's going to happen is if we submit ourselves to the apostles of Jesus and be filled with his spirit in that life. So how about in our doctrine and decision making? When's the last time a doctrinal question came up? maybe in this church, maybe in your family, maybe in your own personal life. And by the way, doctrine isn't just, what are we going to do in church? Doctrine is, how am I going to handle this conflict at work? Doctrine is, how am I going to raise my kids? Doctrine is, how am I going to spend my money? Those are all doctrinal things. Just as much as, how are we going to worship? How are we going to use the church's treasury? Those sorts of things. You get me? How do you make your doctrinal decisions? How do you evaluate that? Do you ever say things like this? 
uh, this recently happened. And I, and I get where the, this individual is coming from, and I don't mean any disrespect to him, but I think it's a very flawed way of answering the question. There's a question posed about, hey, what do you think about blah, blah, blah? And they said, well, in the Church of Christ, we believe, uh-oh, who, who gave us any authority to establish doctrine? The Church of Christ are the people who belong to the King. And we don't believe whatever we believe. We believe what He says we're supposed to believe. So to say, well, in the Church of Christ, we believe, that's a dangerous kind of way of thinking. Not because I think we're not the true people of God or something like that, but because that's not a real foundation for belief. The foundation is, what did the apostles of Jesus Christ have to say as we find them here in the scriptures? You get what I'm saying? How do you evaluate your city? Well, you know, my family's always, who cares about your family? I mean, I love you, but I mean, who cares about making decisions? Your family doesn't have any kind of authority. We can't access the power of the spirit just because your family does so and so. If we're going to make proper decisions that would lead us to live lives that are truly filled with God's spirit, we better be saying, what did Jesus say through his apostles? That's really the only question that matters when it comes to our doctrine and our decision making. How about this? What about in the things that we do? How do we determine how we're going to minister to each other and serve each other and encourage each other and go out into the world and preach the gospel and love our neighbors as ourselves? How do you decide how to do that? You know, one way to do that is just kind of look around and be like, all right, that person, I like what they're doing. I'm going to do some of that. That's good. That's, we'll do what that person says. You know, preacher so-and-so, elder so-and-so, sister such-and-such, they're really good. We're going to follow after them. That's not going to work. That's not going to hold. That's not the standard that we're trying to live by as we try to decide and understand how to serve. And I'll tell you, the the danger in that kind of uh, line of reasoning is, one, they may be doing something wrong, and then you're going to follow them and their ideas about how to serve God's purposes in the world. But you know what something else is bad about that? Is it's just going to discourage you pretty quick. Do you all know some people that that seems like they're good at all of the stuff that you're supposed to do in following Jesus? And they serve perfectly. They're so hospitable and they're so wise and they know all the Bible answers and they're really compassionate and they're all this kind of stuff. At least this is what you think. They know better and maybe other people know better. But if you hold them as the standard, you're going to miss out on what the apostles said. Things like, hey, we're a body and there's a bunch of different people who by the Spirit, are operating so that we'll be filled with God's Spirit and tied together in God's Spirit more deeply. And that thing that you do that you think is so insignificant and unimportant, it's essential for this thing. And if you want us, if you want to be a part of the body of Christ breathing the Spirit of God, you need to contribute what you have to offer. I love Romans chapter 12. Where's this list of different roles in the body of Christ, right? You got prophets, you got teachers, you got those who exhort, those who lead. And it's all these jobs. You're like, oh, that sounds pretty important. I think we need more of that in this ministry. We need to be doing that kind of stuff. And then do you remember the last one in that list in Romans 12? Verse 8, the, the item that caps off the whole list of describing what we need in the body of Christ as we minister together. It says the one who shows mercy should do it with cheerfulness. Is that a gift? Showing mercy? And some of y'all are thinking, yeah. Because there's some people that that's not a gift that they have. Some of us are not mercy people. You know, and I'm not saying, I mean, we, uh, mercy is something we must uh, do as an act of obedience. But you know what I mean. Some people have been gifted by God with a, a disposition of mercy. A, a character of mercy that is so necessary whenever someone confesses sin, whenever someone has gone through traumatizing experiences, when someone is afraid, you may think, man, my job's not important. I can't do, I can't be a leader. I can't be this, that. I can't do all this kind of stuff. And you know what? Those people can't be mercy people like you can. And if we're going to be people who are being filled with the Spirit more and more each day as we submit to the rule of Christ through His apostles, we need all of those gifts. But here's the problem. If I'm evaluating what's a good kind of ministry and what's a good kind of service based on you and you're basing it on me, we're going to be missing out on the things that we need that God says this is what you need in order to thrive as my people. How about this? We need to be submitting to the apostles and be filled with God's Spirit for our encouragement in times of difficulty. It's so easy when we're discouraged to turn to any number of sources of comfort. Some of them are at least seem pretty benign, you know, entertainment or food or friends and all that, uh, you know, exercise. Things that actually the Bible says, hey, this is good in its proper place. 
But I wonder if sometimes we turn to those things and we submit ourselves to them and say, maybe this will fix me. Maybe this will change me. Maybe this will save me. And it ends up choking us out. And we're not able to be like those saints in Acts 9 and verse 31 that says they continued in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, they multiplied, they increased, they flourished because they said, hey, let's keep doing the Jesus stuff. Let's go to our brother. How about this? Let's do what the scripture says and be miserable and mourn and weep when we need to. How about this? Let's go confess our sins to one another and pray for one another so that we'll be healed. Let's do the stuff that God says when we're in trouble. Instead of trying to find something to patch it up or to fix it or to deal with it, let's just do the stuff that Jesus said through his apostles. And as we do that, we'll be filled with God's spirit. And we'll look up and it'll be very strange. We may still be crying, but somehow we'll be bolder than ever, encouraged, strengthened, comforted to be able to continue even through, especially through the times of difficulty. And in those times, we look ourselves in the mirror or we look around at each other and we say to ourselves, is this the kingdom? Is this it? Are we doing this thing right? Well, let's go back. Let's go back to Jesus' apostles. See what they said was right. Well, what they said he said is right. And as we do our best each day, by the grace of God, every step, to follow in their footsteps as they followed Christ, to listen to what they had to say about what he had to say, more and more we'll just start breathing a little deeper. We'll be growing a little bit stronger. And we'll see that, yes, indeed, we are the true people of God. This is where God's kingdom is. And it doesn't look like it most of the time. Most of the time it looks like just a bunch of kind of messed up people who aren't quite sure what to do. But that's just because we're looking with these kinds of eyes. And we got to learn to see with spirit vision, to see it God's way, that he's making something among his people all around the world that in the end of all things will be better than anything we could have imagined. How about it? Are you being filled with God's spirit? Are you submitting your life to the rule of Christ through his apostles? If you're not, you, you need to. You need to change. You need to repent. You need to turn your life over completely to the rule of Christ so that your life can be filled with joy and peace, so that you can really flourish, so you can be comforted, so that you can be bold in a life that's filled with lots of frightening things. You don't have to be that anymore. You can be changed. If we can help you in any way, come forward while we stand and sing.